So the paper that um, I'm going to present today is called the Universal Language Model Fine-Tuning for Text Cla Classification, or uh, OMFIT. Um, it was published by Jeremy Howard and Sebastian Rudder uh, early last year. Let's see here. So the things that we'll be talking about today is, first of all, introducing the Universal Language Model talking a bit more about transfer learning, how it works in NLP and, and in computer vision, uh, going, some of, going through some of the, the mechanics of how these guys did the transfer learning, um, looking at some experiments that they ran and results, and then we'll wrap up with some applications for text classification using this model and some summary. So, I assume that most of you are familiar with the topic of uh, text classification and the different ways it could be applied, but just as an overview to talk about the importance of, of applying these models in the real world, uh, we can use them to find documents that are relevant for a legal case, whether you're looking to identify spam or not spam, um, abusive comments online, looking at uh, product reviews or movie reviews, whatever it may be, and also um, in politics. So even though we've seen uh, deep learning models improving in the last several years, um, a lot of these models are trained from scratch and they require really large data sets and they take a really long time to train. Um, but in computer vision, we've seen that transfer learning has had a huge impact um, and really led to a lot of the improvements that we've been seeing in the past, say, three, four, maybe five or six years. Um, so in, in, in all these different domains of computer vision, whether it's object detection or classification or segmentation, you never really train from scratch. Um, so you, for those of us who aren't familiar, um, you're take, you usually take a pre-trained model um, that has been trained on a large data set, such as uh, ImageNet, and then you start from there uh, rather than starting from scratch. Now, using, using th this logic or, or looking at the, the impact that transfer learning had on computer vision, um, we can assume that we would get better results if we uh, use transfer learning in NLP rather than randomly initializing our parameters. Um, however, there have been many attempts to do so and not that many have been successful. So the authors claim that it's not the, the concept or the idea of, of fine-tuning a long, uh, language model that's, that's incorrect, but instead it's the way that we actually go about it. We don't really know how to train them effectively um, so that we can do it the right way. And one of the drawbacks of these language models is that they tend to overfit to small data sets and they tend to, um, to forget when they're fine-tuned with a classifier. So another thing is that compared to computer vision, natural language models are typically more shallow and therefore they require different fine tuning methods compared to the computer vision uh, models that we've seen. So the, the universal language model um, addresses these, these issues. It proposes a way to fine tune. It, it talks about this uh, transfer learning method pretty much for any um, NLP task and um, essentially they go about it in, in, in a way that's, that's relatively simple. So they're not trying to uh, play around with any fancy architectures. They use a pretty standard three layer LSTM architecture. Um, there's no attention here, uh, no cool connections or anything like that. And if you could please um, mute uh, until we go around for questions, that'd be great. <clears throat> So then the authors show that with only 100 labeled examples, um, this, this type of model is able to get the, the same performance as training from scratch with much, much larger data sets. So let's talk a bit about how this works. Um, any questions so far? So the idea is to take um, a language model and train it on a large general domain corpus and then to fine tune it on a target task. So 
the thing that makes the this method universal is that you first train it by teaching it English and then you apply it to your specific data set. So then it doesn't matter how large your document is or how many documents you have, what kind they are. Um, you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about the architecture or the training process. You don't need to do any fancy feature engineering or pre-processing. A lot of these things are taken care of for you. Um, and um, it doesn't require any additional in-domain documents or, or labels besides that. So this is this is basically how how the model works, how this pre-training or or transfer learning uh, works. We're going to go through these three steps. Uh, the first one, as I mentioned, is to train a language model on a general domain corpus. Then you take your target data, your target task, and you fine tune um, your language model on that on that data set. And then lastly you fine tune the classifier on your target task. So the idea is to take the language model, train it on a general domain corpus, and in this case, um, they use Wikipedia, and I'll, I'll go through that in a second. Um, the idea is that at each layer, um, basically the, the language model is able to capture different general features of the language. So the assumption is that, you know, if you're training it from scratch, you want to teach it English, it's going to learn some punctuation, it's going to learn grammar, um, it's going to learn all these rules about English, but every layer is going to capture something different, kind of like how we see in computer vision models. And then <clears throat> the authors propose um, a, a discriminative uh, fine tuning method um, on the target task, as well as what they call the slanted triangular learning rates which learn task specific features. So we'll talk about that in a second. And then lastly, uh, we see the classifier that is, that is fine tuned on the target task um, using general, oh, sorry, gradual unfreezing, um, which preserve the, the lower level representations and then adapt to high level ones. So let's talk a bit about this first step, the, the general domain pre-training step. So just like ImageNet has a bunch of different um, images, obviously, from different categories, it's kind of general purpose. There's one object in the middle. Uh, the assumption here is that the, the corpus that you're going to train this, this, um, this model on has to be general as well, to teach it the general properties of the language. So the authors pre-train the language model on a data set called Wikitext uh, 103, which has about uh, close to 30,000 um, Wikipedia articles, which uh, consist of over 100 million words altogether. And they note that the pre-training is, is most beneficial for tasks where you have smaller data sets. Um, and that makes sense because you're taking advantage of this, this, uh, this corpus to teach your, your to teach your language model the basics of the language, and then you can apply them to your small data set. So obviously this, this step is uh, pretty computationally expensive because you are training on a super large data set. Um, they didn't mention how long it took them, but fortunately um, this only needs to take place once and then um, the authors published this and, and we can take advantage of, of their work. So the next step after we trained uh, the language model on a general purpose corpus is to train it on your target task. So no matter how diverse the general domain data is, it's most likely not going to be aligned with your target task. So if you're looking at medical applications, financial, legal, whatever the domain is, whatever your problem is, it's likely that, your, that the general purpose corpus didn't teach your model the specifics of, of that task. So we need to fine tune the language model um, on this target data set. Um, and we do this with these two techniques, uh, the discriminative fine tuning and the slanted triangular learning rates. So again, the assumption here is, is that 
just like in, in computer vision, different layers capture different representations or different types of information, and they should be fine tuned to different extents. So rather than using the same learning grade all throughout, um, the discriminative fine tuning basically allows you to tune each layer with different learning grades. So um, you take the learning, the learning grade of the last layer, and then the previous layers will have a much smaller um, learning grade. And that makes sense because the last layer is essentially uh, trained on your target and the previous layers are basically capturing uh, more general ideas about the language itself. Now, the slanted triangular learning grade um, kind of looks like this. It, it really does look like a triangle. Um, the authors are saying that to adapt the, the model's parameters to your specific task, you needed to converge quickly to, to the region in the parameter space um, in the beginning of the training. And then what you're going to do is you're going to slow it down and kind of refine the, the parameters. So if you use the same consistent uh, learning grade throughout, that's not going to get you to that point. So they propose this, this type of learning rate, which at first linearly increases, and then it linearly decays. Um, and the authors don't really talk much about why this works. They just kind of propose this idea, but it seems like they, they found empirically that this is better than, than other approaches. So um, lastly, the, they add, um, for, for the classifier itself, we take this pre-trained uh, language model and then we add two additional linear blocks on top of it. So they borrowed again from the domain of computer vision, um, taking two blocks. Um, each block basically has batch normalization and dropout uh, with ReLU activations and then a soft max um, at the end, which gives you the probability distribution. So after, um, after doing the fine tuning, the authors wanted to first compare their model with uh, kind of these, these, standard, um, these standard data sets, these standard tasks that have been studied uh, quite extensively, but they do it in different domains. So rather than focusing on, on a specific task, whether it's sentiment analysis or topic classification, they show these three different, <clears throat> these three different um, uh, tasks because they wanted it to be as universal as possible. So that no matter what your task is, you can use this, this model. Um, and they also um, go through some experiments where they, they, they break down all these different things and show their, their impact on the model's performance. So in terms of the architecture or some of the hyperparameters, as I mentioned, um, this, this architecture is not too fancy. It's an LSTM um, with an embedding size of 400. It has 300 layers. It has pretty aggressive uh, dropout, again, because we don't want it to overfit to our task. And then uh, we have the learning grade as, as we previously shown. Now, the authors compare themselves to um, what they call state-of-the-art results in, in these different tasks. And they show that they're getting lower error rates or better results for all the tasks that, that they looked at. So whether it's IMDB or this TREK6, um, they show that, that their results are, uh, are the best. And the beautiful thing is that this architecture, as I mentioned, is, is pretty simple. You don't have any attention mechanisms. You don't have any sophisticated embedding schemes. It's again, a relatively simple LSTM with dropout. So then they go, they go on and, and they break the different components. Um, and I'm not gonna go through all of them, but uh, just a couple. So, the authors compare the use of, of pre-training on this large general purpose corpus and, and um, using the model without the pre-training. And we see the results here. Specifically, um, this TREK6 data set is, is relatively small, which leads them to believe that, that pre-training is most useful for the small and medium-sized data sets, um, which are most common. Because in, in practice, you're probably not going to have 
very large data sets to work with. But they show that even with large data sets, such as the IMDB one, um, you still get uh, an improvement. Next, um, they want to talk about the, they show the, the, the impact of having the appropriate language model. So they compare a vanilla language model with the same hyperparameters, but no dropout at all with the, the language model that has the tuned uh, dropout parameters. So they show um, that, that you get much better results even on larger data sets such as the NTB one or the AG, <clears throat> but you get the most benefit on the smaller data sets, um, probably because you avoid this risk of overfitting. So, so these, these dropout layers take care of, of the overfitting. So the, the place where, or the places where, where these models can be applied um, for the most part, <clears throat> the authors claim that when you're looking at, at languages other than English, where you don't have that much supervised um, data, this could be super useful, but they don't, they don't show any, um, any applications in non-English languages. Or if you're looking at an NLP task where you don't really have um, a state-of-the-art architecture. So um, you're coming in, no one has really looked at this problem before, you're not really sure which architecture to use. This seems like a universal <clears throat> applicable um, uh, model for you. And especially if you have limited amounts of data and and some amounts of unlabeled data, which you can take advantage of. <clears throat> so to, to wrap up um, our discussion, the, the universal language model is, is very effective. It's, it's very um, sample efficient. So you don't really need that many samples and you can apply it to a lot of NLP tasks. Um, it, it addresses a lot of the problems with, with, uh, with fine tuning that we saw in the past, such as forgetting. And you can apply it to a, a wide range of tasks. And in terms of the results, the as we saw, the model significantly outperforms um, different existing transfer learning techniques and uh, state of the art architecture on a variety of uh, of tasks. So um, I thought I'd share with you guys uh, a notebook that I did for for a course that I took last semester, I'm doing a master's at, at Georgia Tech in computer science. Um, last semester, we had a final project where I chose to work on, on NLP with a group. And I can go through that notebook and, and show how this, this model is being implemented in Fast AI. Uh, but before doing so, does anybody have any questions? So, um, so JS is asking in the chat whether we still need pre-trained embeddings like Love or Fast Text if we're going with this approach. Um, I'm not sure if I addressed this. I was going to. So, so um, JS, if if you look here at number two, um, and the authors talk about this, I think on the on the first page in the introduction. Basically, when you use uh, word embeddings or, or anything like fast text, um, you're essentially just grabbing the, um, the first layer, right? So again, it's better than starting from scratch because your model has learned English. And, and I know that fast text is really cool because you know they, they train it on a bunch of different languages. Um, but here, you're, it's, it's a lot more extensive in the sense that you're training all the layers rather than just the first one. So you don't need to use fast text or, or any word embeddings uh, like that. Does it answer your question? Cool. Any other questions? Sweet. So let me show you the notebook real quick and you'll see that you don't need glove or fast text or anything like that. Um, just one second. Okay, and um, are you guys able to see this notebook? 
Yep. Is that a yes or no? Yeah, we can see it. Great. Cool. <clears throat> so I start off by um, uh, now. Please, please forgive me if I'm a little fuzzy on the details. Um, it's been a few. It's been maybe three months since I worked on this. Um, but starting off with importing uh, fast AI, um, especially the text model. And then that's pretty much it, right? Pandas, NumPy, and then just scikit-learn for a nice uh, train test split and looking at some of the valuation metrics. So I did the pre-processing pre -processing steps in a different notebook. Um, all it was is just creating this nice data frame to work with. Um, this is, I actually didn't talk about the domain. This is, um, this is um, uh, an open data set called Mimic3. It talks about uh, hospital admissions and releases uh, from this one hospital. Um, it has mostly structured, structured uh, data sets, but this specific, um, this is the only, the only part of the data set that actually has text, right? So this text here is the physician's notes once the patient was, uh, was released or uh, discharged. And, um, I did some of the pre-processing steps in a different notebook, which was pretty standard, just going through removing stop words um, and doing uh, lemmatization. And I think also removing punctuation. So the, the goal here is to take the physician's notes um, in an unstructured text form and predicting which ICD-9 codes, which insurance codes um, this text would mostly, would, would would be classified into. So every time you know you go into the doctor's office or hospital, um, they diagnose you, and that diagnosis is associated with a specific code. So this is what we're trying to do here. Um, the idea is that it doesn't really make sense for for doctors to to go through and search through all these codes and memorize them, and that leads to a lot of a lot of errors. So a lot of companies right now um, are are trying to find ways to do this automatically. Um, so next, just creating a, a test train split. And then you start off with the language model. So you take the, the language model. Um, I followed a bunch of tutorials on the FastAI forum um, or, or online. Um, let me see here. JS is asking if the codes are in the text. So, so no, so. The, the codes are actually um, these, right? So 51881 is a code. And since we have a one associated with it, we see it. And it's not these other ones, but it, it's also C348. So it's, um, it's a multi-label classification problem. And this is the actual text. Um, admission date, discharge, date, date, whatever. These are, th these are the doctor's notes, and they're associated with these two codes. Um, you can have just one code, or you can have multiple codes. So this actually makes the problem a little bit harder, since it's not just a, 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 a single label, but it, rather it's a multi-label classification problem. Uh, so going back to the language model, it's, it's really simple, right? You just grab it from the CSV, and then you tell it which labels are, which columns are the actual labels, um, and then which one is the text. So here, all the labels are, is everything pretty much besides the text. And the text is obviously the text column here. So super simple. <clears throat> and then you're gonna create a classifier on top of that. And it has this vocabulary here. And I believe that BS stands for batch size. Next, um, they have this, this, this model here or this module here called the, the learner. So we just take the language model data that we, we had. We uh, associate it with uh, this AWD architecture. Now, so far, this is the only architecture that's being supported in FastAI, but 
they're looking to add more architectures in the future. And this is something that they talk about in the paper as well for future steps. So training it on a different corpus. And then this is the dropout um, layer. And then here you go through, um, if you guys are familiar with, uh, with Jeremy Howard's approach, if you've seen uh, Fastly Ahead part one or part two, um, they have this, this uh, recorder, which looks at different, um, different learning grades. And then you're supposed to look at where, um, where it kind of tapers off. So right before the bottom is where you, you're supposed to take a step back and, and kind of this region over here between uh, one to negative two or, or, or um, to the negative one is where you see the most significant decrease in the loss. So this is kind of like the area that you want to target in rather than all the way at the end. So then um, you train for one cycle and um, you basically get this kind of like a, a baseline, right? So I think that this is, this part refers to training it on the specific data set. Um, so again, you don't have to do that step one, right? Of training it on a large corpus. You just downloaded it here with the AWD LSTM. Um, I think if you don't have it already downloaded, it downloads it for you and then um, you specify the learning rate, and then you, you do this for one epoch. Um, I spun up a, a, um, a Google Cloud instance because running it on my local machine just took too long. But if you do it with the GPU, as you see, um, the entire epoch, running the entire epoch is about 24 minutes. So it's not too bad. <clears throat> and then to save your progress, um, you, kinda, you, you can save and load it so that if something happens, you, can, you already you don't have to do this step again. Now, this is what the, the model basically saw, right? It's, it's, it's learning all these words from this particular data set that are specific to this medical application, right? So even though the, the, the model was trained on a really large corpus, uh, the Wikipedia one, it's not specific to the medical case. So here it's starting to learn all these different terms that are associated with, uh, with this, um, this data set. So then here we go through the, another uh, set of training here for, for more epochs, um, 10 epochs altogether, and then we, we gradually unfreeze them. And then you can see how um, the validation loss decreases over time until we start to kind of taper off. And again, we can save our, our work so we don't have to do this again. Um, as you see, this took uh, maybe, I don't know, three, three to four hours altogether. I could have continued here a little bit more, but it's starting, to see, it's starting to look like we're getting diminishing results. So there's not much of a point to continue. <clears throat> and then lastly, um, we have this data classifier. So what's nice about the library is that you can actually see the text and then the target classifications um, or the, the, the target labels that we want to classify this text into. So again, we do some more uh, fine tuning with, with a, a dropout layer and we, we freeze it again. We go through this process for the classifier and then we look at this validation loss um, that is much lower than what we saw before. So we repeat this process a few times. Um, this is, this is the learning grade that they initially proposed, but, um, I didn't play around with other learning grades. I could have, I could have trained this for a little bit longer, but I was pretty happy with these results. And you repeat this step a few times. So you're freezing and unfreezing layers. And then each time you go back to earlier layers, you're using a smaller and smaller learning rate. And then lastly, uh, looking at the results, this is pretty simple, right? So just to, to get the predictions, they have this really neat um, method called uh, get predictions. And then we can start evaluating the model. So we have um, an F1 score that doesn't look too high, but keep in mind that, you know, this is a multi-label classification problem. So it's, pretty good compared to other papers that we saw tackling the same problem. Um, so the, the F1 score, the ROC score, 
and then we can actually print out a, a classification report which gives you for each label what was the precision the recall the f1 and so on and then looking at the overall here at the end cool um any questions about this notebook or about the presentation regarding the paper So Brennan is asking to go over the triangular learning grade once again. So let me just switch back to the presentation. And I'll try to find that, uh, that slide. Okay. So this, this, the, the slanted triangular learning grade, or they abbreviate to STLR, is basically this, this type of um, changing the learning grade as you go along. Um, so they're saying that if you use the same learning grade all throughout, or if you use an anneal learning grade, you're not gonna get um, a model that quickly converges to, um, to learn a lot about the parameter space and then refining its parameters. So you have, um, you have a linear increase here. So you're, you're, you're changing um, from going practically from zero to something a little bit faster, and then you slowly kind of taper off, right? So the authors don't really explain why this works. They kind of assume that you want it to, to converge towards a suitable region in the parameter space. And they say that, that this learning rate with a short increase and the long decay period, um, they say is what they found is key for good performance. So I believe that when they say that they found it, it actually means that they tried out different things and just based off of the results, they noted that this works best. Uh, can I add something? Yes, please do. So um, I think the reason the uh, slanted triangular learning rate works is that if, you, if, you're, if your surface error, if your surface error function is like a non-convex function, and then if you don't want to get trapped into like a, one of those local minimas, mm -hmm. then this kind of learning rate can save you from uh, getting trapped in one of those local minimas. So when it, when it increased it like suddenly and then decreased it like gradually, so it makes sure that the, the, the function or the, the loss function doesn't get trapped in one of those local minimas. Yeah, and that, that goes along with, um, I remember seeing one of Jeremy's earlier lectures in Vision where you kind of, uh, um, increase the learning grade and then you he shows that you pop out of these local minima so that you converge towards the the the, the minimum or what is the term for it the global minima right yeah. yeah you play you basically hop around so you don't get stuck um, that makes sense especially in light of what he's doing in vision but they didn't talk about this they didn't mention this at all so what you're saying makes sense but um, I think that they just tried it and they they they, they looked at the results because yeah. they don't this, this um, you know, the, the minima at all. Any other comments or, or thoughts, anyone? Okay, so Pierre's asking how um, this model is different from word to vec or doc to vec or, or fast text, and if we can use it uh, for sentence similarity related tasks. So, um, so again, as I mentioned, let me go back. They're, they're, they're trying to find something different from word to vec where, whereas in word to vec you know, it's been really popular for a lot of years. It was also trained on the large corpus. It's also publicly available, but you're only grabbing the first layer, right? And, and word to vec is essentially a, a word embedding. Um, doc to vec, I'm not sure. I believe it's the same. Um, someone please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that it also just targets the first layer. Whereas here we're fine tuning um, at different learning rates um, the, entire, the entire model and not just grabbing that first layer. Does that answer your question? Oh, and then how, if we can use it for sentence similarity related tasks, I'm not sure. Um, I've, in the past, when I, whenever I wanted to use sentence similarity, I used uh, spacing, I believe with, uh, I think under the hood it has word to vec. 
if I'm not mistaken, or fast text, I'm not sure. Um, I don't think that the, the main purpose here is, is for document similarity. So I would probably just go back and use spacey. I think that what they're trying to do here is, uh, is more topic classification rather than, than similarity scores. Any other questions or comments? Cool. So, so yeah, um, I, the reason that I wanted to present this paper is because um, it seems like, you know, this kind of approach has been, has, has really led to quite significant advances in the field. Um, we're, we're at this place in computer vision where we're getting amazing results because of transfer learning. There's really no reason to train from scratch. Um, again, this is, as you guys saw, fast AI is kind of high level. So it doesn't really let you go in and play around, um, but to get really good results really quick, um, I highly recommend using it. And it seems like it's still a work in progress, so it's still a little buggy. Um, the tutorials aren't that great, but there's a bunch of different, um, different works that people put online, so it really helps to follow and then kind of adapt it to your own use case. So any final questions before we wrap up? Sweet, so if you um, want a copy of this, uh, of this presentation or the notebook, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, here's my, my address. Let me know if you have any questions that come up. No other questions for now, I guess we'll wrap up. So thanks for joining today. And um, until the next time.